a few faces in the audience that are not familiar with CMA, so I just wanted to share just a little bit about us. We have a very focused mission. We want to inspire you, we want to inform you, and we want to connect you at every stage of your career. So whether you're starting out and you want to build your network, or whether you're mid-career and you're thinking about a pivot and you want some mentoring, or if you're established in your career and you want some like-minded folks to think about the critical changes that are happening within the different media verticals that we represent. We're with you every step of the way. Through our programming, through our workshops, through our mentoring, through our research and insights program, through our job board, and through all the connectivity that we do, but more than anything, through our community, because that's just the heartbeat of what CMA is about. We are a 100% run volunteer organization. So if you have fun tonight, please consider joining <laughs> the team and helping out. Um, and on that note, I'd like to thank some very special people. Karen, Chris, Shamika, <laughs> Terry, Henry, who's not here, who ran our entire silent auction, and then all of the volunteers that are here tonight helping us, and all of the volunteers across the organization that made tonight possible, Thank you, and I love being a part of this team. I'd love, to, <laughs> I'd love to also extend an enormous thank you to everyone at Retro Report, especially Victor and Tom. Um, yes. <laughs> if you're not familiar with Retro Report, um, they create short form documentaries that connect the past and the future. It's an incredible organization. And they do everything. They have an amazing library of films, of student activities, and lessons that are applicable from middle school to high school, an enormous resource for all of us that are making media that we can tap into. You can find them at retroreport.org, and all of this is free. So that's a wonderful thing. Um, <laughs> So story time, why are we all here tonight? This is one of my favorite events. This is the first time I've gotten to work on it, in all honesty, but it's now my favorite event. Um, <laughs> brainchild of Sarah Wallenjack um, and, <laughs> and her co-pilot with all of this, Carly. It's a wonderful event, and more than anything, what I love about it is the vulnerability, sharing those special moments that created a change in your life, that you know, you're doing this wonderful, vulnerable environment. But a big part of story time is also our silent auction. So if you saw out in the other room, there's all kinds of items for you guys to bid on. Please do. It's our number one um, fundraiser for the year, so we would appreciate any support if you see anything that you would think would be helpful to your career. There's all kinds of things from industry leaders giving one-on-one -on -one time to tours of the Henson um, studio, so just a whole wonderful group of activities or experiences that you guys can have. But um, let's get on to story time, shouldn't we? Okay. So let me introduce Carly. She is an Emmy-nominated host, writer. She's totally a, a producer, the multi-hyphen in definition. Um, but to me, she's one of the most creative, vivacious people I know, and I love her dearly. So come on up and take this away. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everybody. Yes. Welcome to Storytime. I am so excited. This is my favorite thing on the planet. I'm obsessed with it. You know this. I mean, I'm obsessed with CMA, but I'm obsessed with stories. So I'm, I'm really, really excited for what we're going to hear today. And I just want to like place us in this room together. So who is here at a CMA event for the first time ever in their lives? Okay, a few people. Welcome. We're excited you're here. Who is here at a CMA event in person for the first time since the pandemic? Anybody, first in person? In their human form, okay. Very good. Who is at uh, story time for the first time ever? Oh my gosh, amazing. Okay, great, 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 great. So, so we just have a little, a little understanding of who's here. Okay, here's another question. Who in this room has taken a risk? Oh, I better see all the hands up. <laughs> We've all taken risks, and that is the theme of the event tonight. We're going to hear some amazing stories of risk from our storytellers, um, but just take a moment right now to think of a risk that you took maybe this year. It can be a big risk or a small risk, just any, any kind of a risk. 
for me, because I am indeed a, a multi hyphenate, a lot of my risk taking involves um, like saying a big yes or delivering a brave no. That's kind of the thing I'm always wrestling with. But, uh, you know, whatever the, the scope or size of the risk that you might be thinking of right now, my guess is it's been a pretty generative moment of your life. Risks are generative, um, which is why they make for good stories and personal stories. As the youth say, they hit different. OK, <laughs> So that's why, that's why this event is about stories and it's not a presentation. No one is using notes, even though I do have some notes here. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> but there's no notes, there's nothing to read, there's no, there's no presentation, there's no PowerPoint, although there is gonna be a little bit of a reel before each person so you get to know them a little bit better. Um, but they don't have like props that I know of. <laughs> So we're here, we're here to, to listen to personal stories. Um, and actually, something we're doing a little bit differently this year is after the stories are told, there's going to be a Q&A. So if while you're listening, I mean, my hope is while you're listening, you find a point of connection or a point of reflection um, that really draws you in. And maybe there's going to be something you want to ask about later. You know, file that away for the Q&A. You also might be wrestling with a, a risk to take or not to take right now, and maybe this is just gonna nudge you over the edge. So that would be my hope and wish for you, perhaps. Um, but, okay, let me just make sure I said everything that I wanted to say, all my dreams have come true. Oh, so, uh, you know, Susie mentioned that, that this is a, the brainchild of Sarah Wallenjack, and um, she was heavily inspired by The Moth, and we have um, taken some, of, some structural things from The Moth, too. You had the opportunity when you came in to share a risk that you have perhaps taken on a slip of paper, and I have a bunch of those, so I'll be sharing them throughout, just reading from this group right here, risks that we have taken. I'll give you an example, I've got two right here. So um, here's one. I left my day job as a web producer at the United Nations to write a book without a literary agent or a publisher. That's a risk. Yeah. Okay. And then here's one that I love. Uh, coming tonight to socialize. But I regret nothing. So risk. <laughs> but like, yes, it's hard to do these things. And like, hi, how are you? What are you up to? Like, it's a risk. But this is a, a safe and beautiful place to be in that risk, so I'm glad it's one that you all took. So I know a lot of you came from, I mean, other places. Some, you know, we had people coming up from Philly, people coming in from Astoria. Um, like, <laughs> like maybe you, maybe you had a bit of a day today. Um, so in order to prepare you to listen, we're just going to like, we're gonna like drop the day a little bit to really help us listen. And if you've been at Storytime before, you, we've, you've done this perhaps. Um, so just close your eyes for a second. We're just gonna breathe together. Um, before we start breathing, well, you're, don't stop breathing. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Keep your eyes closed. Uh, so just find three points of tension in your body right now and, and release them. So it might be the space between your eyes. It might be your jaw or your shoulders. So just locate one spot, soften it, and locate another spot, soften, one last spot, soften, and we're just going to do three breaths together, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. Okay, open your eyes. Oh, we're so ready to listen to some stories right now, right? Okay, yes, we may clap. Um, all right, so one thing about um, when we bring the storytellers up on stage, it's super important to make so much noise and give them so much love because they might be nervous, like, you know, they're going to tell their personal lives to you, like they don't even know you yet. So um, we're just, just keep clapping, keep making noise until they're up on the stage so they don't have to walk in silence. Uh, <laughs> uh, so our first storyteller tonight, I'm so excited for you to meet him. He's a musician, he's a social justice activist and educator. Everyone make some noise for Fuchs. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Woo. All right, that was awesome. That was awesome. I want to take my time with that. All right. So when I was 14, I decided I wanted to be a famous rapper. Now, this was pre-social media, so it was only one way to make it. You had to record a hot mixtape. And then you had to get signed to like Rockefeller, Jay-Z, you know, it's your boy, Hope. So that was the goal. And then blow up. Simple, right? Very easy. And I was sticking to the plan. 
A couple years later, actually, I got a full ride scholarship to Belmont University. But thank you. But I was convinced. I told my mom, I said, I'm probably going to have to drop out by the end of freshman year because, you know, I was going to be so famous. The paparazzi was going to be following me to my classes and stuff. No pictures. But alas, five years later, I graduated a little wiser, a little more grounded and a whole lot of broke. I needed a job. I needed a job. So I became a teaching artist and I was teaching music and poetry in kindergarten through 12th grade classes. It was, it was a pretty cool little gig, you know? It was flexible. I still got to perform, you know, on the weekends and after at night when I needed to. It was pretty decent money. And come on, it was something that I wish I had when I was in school. And, um, but you know, it was temporary. Come on, working with children? Come on, this was kids. It was temporary. But temporary turned into 10 years and, uh, <laughs> After a while, I was not only a beast of writing these bars, I'm a beast of writing curriculum. But I was very certain about keeping both sides of that separate. I was the music artist Fuchs over here. In classrooms, I was Mr. Harold. My students call me Mr. Harold. I had the khakis, you know. Because I'm not gonna lie, I wasn't really super proud of the aspect of my teaching artist career. There was a guy at one of my shows, actually. He said, um, so man, what do you do? I said, I'm a music artist. He said, no, what do you really do? What's your job? Like, what makes you money? Man, that question made me so mad. It made me so mad because honestly, I, I was kind of embarrassed of the fact that I was a teacher a little bit. I only wanted people to know about the rap music artist side of things. And, uh, you know, I didn't think it was a cool way to be a rapping teacher. What, what was I supposed to do? I'm a rapping teacher and I'm really cool. I stick in school and I follow the rules. <laughs> that was the way it was in my head. I didn't really know there was a cool way to combine it. But, you know, I was kind of ignoring the fact of the impact that the classes I was doing was having on these kids, like the impact of the communities that I would come from, that I would be doing this in, giving them a way to express themselves through art, to dig into history and current events. Also, I wasn't realizing the fact that being in the classroom directly fed my artistry. It kept me sharp. I was constantly creating. Being in front of the class was a direct audience. It was like I was performing all the time. And you know, I ain't gonna lie, like it kept me current. After 30, it's hard to keep up with them TikTok trends and so I don't know what they be doing and stuff. So it was actually a really good fit, but I wasn't really seeing it in that way. But I think life has a way to scooch us in the direction where we're supposed to be. Should we be so receptive to the winds of change, a, a divine nudge from the almighty if you have it. So sure enough, 2017, I was working with a third grade teacher in the Bronx, Miss Parks, and she was awesome. She said, will you do the black history lesson plan for the class? I said, OK, yeah, I'll do that. So I got on YouTube, typed something up, tried to find a song to start the lesson plan with something fun, engaging that talked about black history. But before slavery, it seemed like the second we get into February, all you hear. Mm -hmm. So I was like, the third graders don't need that. Let's keep it hype. And then I wanted to find something that talked about some more current black people that made some amazing accomplishments besides the starting five. You know, we got MLK, we got Malcolm X, we got Rosa Parks, we got Harriet Tubman. And number five, you can go Oprah Obama. Take your pick. You can go either one. But I feel like it was always that. And I could not find exactly what I was looking for. So for the first time, I combined my rap powers with my teaching powers and I made something. So I made a little beat, did some research, learned the lyrics, got a little camera out, put up a green screen, recorded myself, edited it, put it on YouTube and uh, released it. Not under Fuge, nah, this is under Mr. Harold. Cause I'm like, nah. <laughs> It's for the children, it's cute, it's for the kids. It's not my actual music, you know? And I showed it to the students, right? I showed it to them and they lit up. It was special, man. They were on the edge of their seats. They were like, oh my God, that, that's you, Mr. Harold, that's you. Me and Miss Parks had a little moment. We looked at each other in the back of the class. It was like, oh, this is special. And it was. Meanwhile, there were thousands of teachers around the country who was looking for that exact same kind of content. So the video, took off 
And I didn't expect that. I started getting messages. Hey, can we get the instrumental? Can we get the beat? Can we get this? Can we get the lyrics? We want to perform it. I started getting videos of kids performing my words at assemblies, seeing them do the movements I was doing. Start thinking to myself, the wheel started turning. Could I? Should I? Would I? Nah, nah, nah. Two more years passed before I even considered and thought about doing anything else for kids. And what did it was the pandemic. Teaching went virtual. Technology was more important than ever to educators. Kids were on the screens more than ever. Engagement in our classes were down. So while I was trying to find engaging songs on topics like Juneteenth, Black Hair Appreciation, Indigenous Peoples, couldn't really find it. So I finally made that decision. I accepted the calling and I never looked back. Now, thank you. You see, for me, the risk was letting go of the way that I thought my life was supposed to be. The way that I thought a rap career was supposed to go, the way I thought, you know, our, our success meant for me. Really, I thought leaning into education felt more like settling. It felt like I was giving up on my dreams, which really now I can see it so clearly. It was obviously the leap I needed to rise to the occasion to step into that role. And really, once I actually accepted that, I found a much fuller life on the other side of that. I found a community of people who were already doing the same thing. Educators and artists that were trying to find creative ways to tell these stories that we were passionate about. And also, at that time, the things that I wished for when I was a 14-year-old kid actually kind of started happening. Performing, touring, television appearances, going to the Grammys, getting nominated with my one child. Yeah. And this is for children's music. I was like, what? <laughs> Who'd have thunk it? And it only took me 20 years to finally hit the whole full-time artist career. But I'm proud, prouder than ever to say that I'll always be a teacher. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> wow. You just started us off so good. Thank you for that. Um, just also, so many sound bites, like the, the beast of bars, the beast of curriculum. That's so good. Talking about a universal scooch here and there. Like, I think we can all relate to, like, am I being scooched in this direction? Am I being scooched? I think it's, like, it's hard to, like, see the scooch and allow it. And, like, um, it just, it, it speaks to courage. It speaks to vulnerability. Um, and I think, I think we can all in some way relate. So thank you for sharing. Um, I want to read one that came through um, earlier. Earlier, this is a little lengthier, but it's beautiful. So it's a story of risk from someone in here. Feel free to reveal yourself if you want. You don't have to. Uh, okay, so I was working at a terrible job in LA, but it was across the street from the headquarters of NPR. I heard the end of a news story that morning, and so I wanted more info about it. I arrived at the door, and an employee was walking by and opened the door to help me. I asked, what do you do? And he says, I am an audio engineer manager. And I said, oh, well, I'm an audio engineer. Within in one month, I was working at NPR, and I stayed for five years. Best job ever and best risk I ever took. Just walking across the street, saying hello. That's, that's awesome. I love that. So we've got another story coming to you. Oh, yes, okay. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Our next storyteller is the um, executive producer and vice president of Sesame Street Productions. I, I don't know, have you guys heard of Sesame Street? It's like a little cool, fun show. Anyway, please welcome to the stage, Sal Perez. Thank you, thank you everybody. Uh, just in case you didn't know, life is full of risks. Uh, and I know it's pretty obvious, and so leave it to a Sesame Street guy to, to tell you something that's super obvious. Uh, uh, but really, you know, we make choices every day in our lives. Uh, but really, there's only some really major life-changing risks that, that we have to take. Uh, and how do you know when those moments arrive? Uh, luckily for me, I think I was meant to work at Sesame Street my whole life. Uh, so I kind of grew up knowing, you know, to really to close my eyes and listen to my body uh, whenever any of those situations would arise. Uh, so, you know, when there's a situation or a decision that feels scary, 
uh, that feels a little daunting. Your your body gets a little you know tingly. Uh, your mouth gets a little dry. Uh, you, you start to get a little dizzy. Maybe a little bit about how I'm feeling right now. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, when those moments happen, I have found uh, that the best thing to do is uh, to listen to your body, to lean in, and lean into that discomfort. Lean into those situations that might uh, mean something else, might change your life. Uh, so for me, it's always been uh, an ethos of the moment is scary, feels daunting, and if it feels like I don't know what the result is going to be, uh, that means it's worth it. Uh, so today I'm going to tell you the story of, uh, of those times I've had those, those risks come up in my life. Uh, and, and how I'm here today. Um, so I'm originally a Mexican-American, uh, first generation uh, from California, Viva Mexico. Uh, uh, I, my parents and my family is as far away from kids media as it can be, but I grew up watching TV, watching films. Uh, we would go to church and then go to the matinee. At some point we stopped going to church and we'd just go straight to the matinee. <laughs> and uh, I just really fell in love with storytelling. I would actually, uh, translate movies in real time for my parents before there was DVDs with Spanish soundtracks and all of that stuff. Uh, and I really fell in love with storytelling. And so I wanted to be in the movies. I wanted to be in, in TV. So uh, I ended up applying uh, to NYU Film School. Uh, I had never been to, to New York. I grew up in California. Uh, and I got in. Somehow I got in. Uh, and I just remember how scared I felt uh, about coming to this big city. I still remember how I felt the moment I uh, was waiting outside the dorm in line, just kind of shaking. Uh, and and at, at that moment, it dawned on me, oh, this feels a little scary. That's got to mean it's worth doing. Uh, so I started to live my life that way. And near the end of uh, my senior year of college, uh, I was looking for a job or an internship like everybody else, and I had another decision to make. Uh, I had an offer to be a, uh, uh, an unpaid internship, as we've all probably have done that at some point in our lives. Or I actually got an opportunity a, 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 to have a position, have a job, a paying job at Sesame Workshop. Children's media. I had never really thought about being in children's media. I had always really, you know, you go to film school, you think you're going to be Scorsese. Uh, not a rapper in my, in my case, but I thought I was going to be, um, you know, one of those kind of auteur directors or something like that. And so I never really thought about children's media. Uh, but I didn't really listen to my body at that point. What I did was, uh, as the child of an immigrant, uh, you do, you take the paying gig. Um, <laughs> so I ended up at, at Sesame Workshop. I ended up being the production coordinator for Plaza Sesamo, uh, which is our uh, Latin America co-production. Uh, and I worked at Sesame for, based here in New York for six years. It was an incredible time. I learned so much during that period of my life. Uh, it was like going to film school again, but don't tell NYU, I, didn't get, I, I got paid to do that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I, I, I really started to fall in love with children's media. I really started to care about the content that we were making and how it was changing kids' lives. Uh, there was kids like me that were watching something that I was making, and it was maybe the first thing they ever watched. Uh, and that was really inspiring. But as we tend to do in our young, in our 20s, uh, you start to get a little voice in your head, and you think, Is this, did I make the right choice? Uh, did I take the right risks? Uh, so I really thought about, oh, is there life outside of children's media? Well, at, at 28, uh, I got a call uh, that would allow me to explore that. Uh, I got the opportunity to work as a producer on a production in Mexico um, for the adaptation of Gossip Girl. Uh, so I, I asked my friend who had called and said, uh, you know, what's the, what are you going to call it? Uh, well, he said, uh, Gossip Girl Acapulco. So I was like, oh, <laughs> sure, sure, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I started to listen to my body. I started to think, you know, wh what's going on? Uh, I felt tingly. I felt, you know, my, like my stomach dropped. Uh, I felt really nervous. Uh, what was I going to do? I was really scared about trying, you know, I would leave New York. I would leave the one job I had and insurance. You know, at, in your 20s, having insurance is a big deal. But it felt scary. It felt daunting. So it felt like it's something that was worth doing. Um, so I moved to Mexico. I uh, spent my first five months in Acapulco uh, living in a hotel, which maybe sounds nice, but if you've ever worked somewhere where there's people vacationing, not that great. Uh, there was more drama behind the camera than there was in front of the camera. Uh, but, you know, that whole time I really honed my skills as a producer. Uh, I really figured out uh, how to start a production from the ground up. I learned uh, to have plans A, B, C, and D for anything that might happen. Uh, I learned how to, you know, come in from as an outsider and adapt and really connect with a, with a large group of people on a production. 
Um, it's just really skill sets that as a producer of television, you know, are, are things that you need to learn. Um, so I was so thankful for that. But I also happened to fall in love while I was in Mexico. I met, uh, yes, uh, I met a wonderful, talented, amazing costume designer on Gossip Girl. Uh, and I could probably do a whole 10 minute story on just that relationship. And, but uh, uh, I won't get into it now, but suffice it to say uh, that I learned when you're taking big risks in your life, you really need that emotional support. You need somebody that's, that's with you, uh, that's helping you keep centered. Uh, because during those moments, you know, I felt so scared about being in a, in a new place. I regretted it uh, several times. I thought, what am I doing? Why am I here? Uh, this production is going crazy. It was supposed to be 10 weeks and it went five months. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, my, my, uh, uh, my girlfriend at the time, uh, you know, she really kept me centered and let, helped me keep focused and really be thankful for the opportunities that I was having. There. Uh, I ended up having two of the best years of my life living in Mexico. Uh, and then, you know, I got, uh, I got another call. This was in 2014, uh, and I recognized the number. And, you know, when you recognize the number and you kind of know what the call is going to be about, you start to get, a, your stomach drops a little bit, and you're a little nervous, and you're like, oh, should I answer this? Uh, and so I, I picked up, and it was Sesame Workshop offering me an opportunity to come back, come back to New York uh, for a role. Uh, at that point, I didn't know what to do. Do I, again, drop everything, move back to New York? Uh, and start again. Uh, it's something that, like, the role it was going to be as an international production. I don't know if the role itself felt scary at the time, but it was, you know, because I started to feel, you know, I learned so much in Mexico. I have so much more to offer uh, Sesame Workshop and kids media uh, that I really started to, started to think I should, I should take this. I started to really miss and think about everything that I was doing in kids TV and what that meant and, and that I wanted to go back to it making Gossip Girl and some other things, you know, not exactly the most life-affirming content in the world. So I was really itching to come back to something that I knew would mean so much to kids around the world. Then there, the big risky decision was for my girlfriend, uh, because it was up to her to pick up and leave. Uh, I did say to her one time, like, well, babe, if, if it's scary, maybe it's worth it. <laughs> I, I got the side eye, I got the side eye. Uh, but she came. Uh, and so I was at Sesame Workshop. I came back in 2015 and oversaw an international production. And uh, a few years later, I, I got an opportunity to move over to the U.S. side. Now, uh, people, at least at Sesame, and I'm sure in a lot of parts, you don't really jump from international production to uh, the U.S. productions. But I threw my hat in the ring and applied to be a supervising producer of that role. I just had so much more to offer than what I had you know, before I left Sesame the first time uh, to be able to be in that role, to be a leader, um, to, to bring a, a more global perspective to what we were doing uh, on the U.S. show. So I threw my hat in the ring and, and uh, got the role. Uh, and then over time, I started, you know, during the pandemic, you know, about a year and a half ago, uh, I became the executive producer of Sesame Street. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, you know, this role itself uh, often feels scary, feels daunting. Uh, there's only been a handful of executive producers in the history, in the 50 plus year history of the show. And I'm the first Latinx executive producer for Sesame Street. So that is quite an accomplishment. Thank you. Uh, it's such a big responsibility uh, being the EP for the show, but it's an even bigger responsibility for representation. Uh, and it's not something that I take lightly. And I like to share my story, not because I think I've done this crazy, huge thing, but it's more because it didn't take more than just listening to my body uh, to make the decisions to get me to where I am today. And that's something all of you can do. So I hope that people take that with you. Uh, and now I'm thankful when there are those moments, because let me tell you, this job is scary. It's daunting every day. Uh, but you know what? Now that we're doing emotional well-being on Sesame Street, and <laughs> I've learned some moments, I've learned some tools. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, whenever those moments come up, I, you know, I take a deep breath. I've learned some butterfly hugs. Uh, so if, I, I don't know if everybody wants to do a butterfly hug real quick. Let's do it. Let's do it. So take a deep breath in. And when I breathe out, I know it's worth it. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank now we're married with two kids. Woo! Love! Oh my gosh, thank you so much for that story and for and for bringing up the feeling that comes with risk um, because it is one that you can really locate and you can get better at practicing listening to. Um, so thank you for, for bringing that to us. Um, I want to read two 
that we have here. This is so brave. I started a preschool cooking company from my grad school project. It failed, but taught me so much and gave me so many cool opportunities after. No regrets. So yeah, like risks. Again, risks are generative um, in whatever direction. Like you get so much information when you listen to your body and take a risk. Um, and then this other one we have, I am proud to say that I have always taken risks in my career. I have transitioned careers four times already and I'm moving into children's media as my fifth career. Career risk takers unite. Yes. <laughs> This next storyteller and I actually, we, we go way back. Uh, we met um, working on a show together, hosting a show together called Sunny Side Up for Sprout. Uh, yeah, which involved taking the daily risk of doing live unscripted television with a chicken puppet. Uh, so just like a lot of knowings and learnings and feelings in your body. It was just the best time. But, but right now she's known a little bit more for her work as Mika, Blippi's best friend. She is an actor, writer, comedian, hilarious person, Caitlin Becker. <laughs> Hi, it's been a long time since I've talked not in a character, so I'm just going to be Caitlin Becker today. This is good. Might be some uh, words coming out of this mouth that are not for the children, so. Um, anyway, just to give you some background, I was born in Indiana, raised in northern Kentucky. I'm biracial. My biological father is uh, African American and my mother is white and I didn't have a relationship with my biological father or that side of the family. My mother remarried when I was six to a white man and they had three white babies. So I got three white siblings, cool. So, <laughs> so I was the only black girl in most parts of my life, like in school, church, my own family. And my first memory of seeing a black person on television or someone that looked like me was when I was four years old watching Sesame Street. Yeah, I was really um, attracted to that show. One, because I liked that they lived in a cool like city and that the humans on that show looked like me. A lot of them looked just like me. And I have a super vivid memory of standing so close to the TV that I could feel like the static fuzz on my nose. And my grandma saying like, get back, scoot back. Like I was gonna scoot back, but I was just like, I gotta like get in there. Like I wanted to be in that world so bad. And that really was the start of me itching to live in a city on theme. <laughs> and, and be in an environment with a lot of diversity where I could blend in and not stand out so much. And that didn't happen for 18 years because I stayed in Villa Hills, Kentucky, which is real white, even to this day. So let's like jump ahead to high school where I was living the dream um, of performing in all of my high school musicals and telling everyone like, one day I'm gonna move to New York City <laughs> and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be an actor and I'm gonna work in whole new theaters and be really grungy and artsy. And they were just like, okay, girl, cool. Um, and the drama club at my school, we used to go to Cincinnati to see the national tours come through. And the first time I saw someone that looked like me on stage was Rent, ever heard of it? And I was obsessed with Mimi because the girl who played Mimi in that production looked just like me. And I was like, didn't even know that I could play a lead role in a Broadway show. Like there, you know, like representation matters. I was like, I look just like her. And so, yeah, thank you, yeah. Well, if you like that, there, there's more. So, so I just, got really obsessed with the idea of living in New York, but like starving artists. Like I wanted to like hang out on fire escapes and smoke cigarettes and like, and I would picture like screaming at the people down, down the street. And then I, and then I picture like being inside my apartment with the broom hitting the ceiling, like be quiet, Linda, I'm studying my lines. Like I just wanted like to suffer, I guess, and have like a terrible life. And, and I was just really into like the smoking bit on the fire escape. So, um, Anyway, I could not move to New York City right away. I had to further my acting career. So I stayed in Kentucky and went to Northern Kentucky University, got my BFA in musical theater. And uh, my parents did not have the money to help me at all in college. Like I, I got zero financial support from them. And so I was always looking for ways to make money while I was in college. And so I did a lot of like babysitting. And then I got a job at the Goddard School uh, being assistant to all of the preschool teachers. So I just floated around and, and helped the teachers. And I was really involved in their summer camp program. 
And for the holidays, I wrote an original musical with original music for the kids. And I just loved working at the Goddard School and connecting with those kids. Um, and I worked there my entire long five years um, in college. And I saved almost $5,000. And I was like, well, I'm ready to go to New York City. <laughs> so, so I did it. I left my little small white town of Kentucky and I moved to New York City thinking like, I can't believe I'm moving to New York so rich. Like, <laughs> I'm already starting off so great. Like, just really clueless. So that's the first risk. And the first week I lived there, I walked down the street to the bodega and I bought a backstage newspaper and a pack of cigarettes. I'm not pushing smoking, by the way. Like, it's really bad. <laughs> like, don't smoke. I don't smoke anymore, but I was like really into it. And so um, I didn't have a smartphone because it was 2007. I didn't even have a computer. I used to like go to the internet cafe to check my email. Um, so I get the newspaper and I'm sitting on the curb, like smoking my cigarette, like, look at me. <laughs> I'm an artist. And I'm like circling auditions in the backstage newspaper and I see an audition for a musical called A Kid's Life. So I go to the audition and I book it. Week one of New York, so I was like, I'm loaded with money. I'm a smoker and I booked my first show and it was four kids. It was four kids. So I'm like with y'all and kind of like the kid stuff. Like I was like, this is not the grungy artistic route I was planning to take, but it was a show for, for kids and I secretly loved it. But on the outside, I was like, yeah, I'm just like doing this like little opera. It's for kids. Like don't come. Like, um, but I secretly like really loved it. It was so, so fun. Um, but for some reason I was being weird and like embarrassed about it. So I did a ton of musical theater for years and then I decided to refocus my career to TV film. And one day I get an email from a casting director and in the subject line it says, do you want to work with a chicken? And I went to delete it like, <clears throat> and then I was like, wait a second. Because <laughs> my nephew at the time was obsessed with the Sunny Side Up show. Thanks for giving away my whole story. Oh, geez, that's so <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. So, so I was like, oh, he's obsessed with the Sunny Side Up show. And I don't need to describe it because Carly kind of did. But the main character on the show was a puppet, a chicken puppet named Chica. And I was like, I bet that's the show. So then I'm like, let me look at this email. Let me see what they're up to. And they said they were looking for a host. And um, there were really like specific things they were looking for. They were looking for experience with kids, specifically preschool, Goddard School. Mm -hmm. um, it was like improv, music background, acting background, like every single thing I was like, have I been training my whole life to be a host on the Sunny Side Up show? <laughs> like, oh my God. Then I was like, you know what? Let me just make a video and see what happens. So I make a video, I send it to the casting director. They like it, they call me back, they call me back. They say, hey, if you, get this job, you have to move to Philadelphia. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> but New York or bust, you know, like New York. But the show filmed live out of Philadelphia. So there's, there's no way around it. You have to live in Philly to be a host on the Sunny Side Up show. So I was like, ah, I don't really want to live in Philly. I don't know Philly. I don't know anyone there. I'm a New Yorker, damn it. Like New York or bust. And <laughs> Then I just kind of got out of my own way because all the callbacks, they just felt really good. And I was like, I'm good at this. I should do this. Like, all right, the hell with it. So I, I moved to Philadelphia and of course I loved it. I loved the show like one weekend in love with everything. Love the chicken. <laughs> then a uh, short, like, a few months into my contract, the announcement was made that the show is moving to New York City. <laughs> and so we're also filming out of 30 Rock Studios. So I was like, oh, okay, I'm living in New York, I'm working in New York, I'm acting, and I'm doing a show out of 30 Rock Studios. And I was like, this is amazing. And then, you know, it's the biz. So 2017 show canceled, done. No sunny side up, no Sprout Network. Yeah, it's fine, it's fine. So I, I have a baby and I am doing voiceover stuff for kids animation. I was like, yeah, this feels good, being behind the camera. Um, I don't think I want to do like kid host stuff anymore. I was like, yeah, yeah, this is feeling good. Then COVID happens, beginning of the pandemic. It's like early enough where we don't know what's going on. We don't know what kind of mask to wear. And I get an email from Moonbug Productions, who I've never heard of before. And they said, hey, some people who know you from Sunny Side Up are recommending you for this character that we're creating. Can we meet? And I was like, man, kid stuff, like, mm -mm. like. Like New York, you know, I, I, I don't know what's my problem, but they were just like, can we please just meet with you? 
So I meet with them just over Zoom, COVID, and they're like, I don't know if you know about Blippi. And I was like, never heard of him. Uh, and truly never, because my son at the time, like he didn't watch YouTube. I really had never heard of Blippi. And they're like, what? Well, we want a best friend for him. And you were recommended because of Sunny Side Up. And I was like, who told you about Sunny Side Up? <laughs> and then, uh, and so, so uh, I was like, I don't know if I want to do this. And I was like, I got to sleep on it. So then I like mask up and I went to Target because I was potty training my son Everett at the time. And I know nothing about Blippi, but I go into Target and there's Blippi underwear. So I was buying like big kid underwear for my son. And I was like, are you kidding me? This character is like on underwear. So, so I bought it and I was like, this is my sign. I'm gonna go to LA and meet with these people and body train Everett later. So I go to LA, I meet with them. We're like testing out this character that wasn't Mika at the time. And I was like, cool, I like these people. I like this character. Uh, fine, I'll do kid stuff again, twist my arm. So then a couple months later they said, um, we wanna bring you to LA. It's gonna be 10 to 12 weeks. You have to live in Los Angeles. Um, we're gonna film Lippy's Treehouse with Amazon Kids. And I was like, well, first of all, I keep telling you like, New York, New York, New York, New York, New York. It's my dream, my dream, my dream, my dream. And they're like, okay, relax on the New York vibes. Do you want to do the show? And I said, okay, yes. So I left my son for 10 weeks to do Blippi's Treehouse. And now this character, Mika, um, she now has her own YouTube channel and a spinoff series on Netflix. And the doll was announced a few days ago. There's a Mika doll. Thank you. All that kind of stuff kind of like weirds me out. Um, I, I don't get excited over those things. The like number one coolest thing and the reason I do what I do is I, I now get regular messages from parents and kids who look like me and pictures and videos of kids literally like this. <laughs> and, and they're seeing themselves in the Mika character. And uh, people are writing saying, my kid says you're their best friend. My kid says you look just like them. When's the Mika doll coming out? Because she looks just like my daughter. And like. It's just, ugh, not me giving myself the chills. Um, <laughs> but it's just so crazy. Um, and I just want to say, like, I'm, I'm so glad that I auditioned to work at that damn chicken because, like, if I would not have done that, I probably would not be playing Mika. And I'd probably have been re re reaching out to these little brown boys and girls at home. And so life is crazy. Take the risk because if you don't, you could miss out on, on so much. On so much. So thank you for your time. <laughs> Oh my goodness. I mean, I shed a tear. Um, thank you. That was incredible. And I know there are so many people in this room who have the power to further the Representation Matters mission. Um, so like, may we really like let that story sink into our bones and all the levels, um, because there, there are people with a lot of power in this room and there are people who are going to have a lot of power in this room. So I'm glad we can all like hear these stories together. Okay, I have two more of these and then we have another story here. I turned down a dream job because I couldn't afford to live on the salary. Oh my gosh, pay the writers. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I gave <laughs> I gave up a four thousand dollar a week freelance gigs doing promotional shorts for one thousand dollars a week producing a good TV, kids TV show. I think this is a risk of pay, getting paid less to do something better. Yes, which I love that. Um, okay, so next up we have a story with many risks in it, I know. She is an author, an illustrator, a businesswoman, a multi-hyphenate. Um, I would like to introduce you now to Susie Hamadio. My mom used to get a lot of notes that said, Susie does not know how to follow directions. <laughs> And it was true. I, I, I marched to my own drummer, as I was told. Um, I was dyslexic, and um, I couldn't spell to save my soul, but I could read. And I loved reading, and I read every single thing I could get my hands on. And my handwriting was really sloppy, but I could draw. And I loved drawing, and we didn't have a TV because my mom thought TV was evil. So, <laughs> I grew up on books, and when I wasn't reading, I was drawing. And, and little by little, you know, I got good, and, and, and kids noticed, and they were like, oh, you're an artist. And I was like, oh, that seems to be what I do well. <laughs> and so when I graduated high school, and my mom was like, what do you want to do? I was like, I'm going to go to art school. And she was like, cool, that sounds like a plan. Because you know what? I was the number four child, girl child of five, and the expectations were nice and low. <laughs> so I could do whatever I wanted to do. Um, and my siblings, of course, informed me that I would be broke because I was never going to be Picasso, 
So I had to be a starving artist because there's nothing really between being a Picasso or being a starving artist, right? So none of us had any idea that there was this whole creative field out there, right? I just knew that I wasn't cut out for a normal job. I wasn't cut out for a nine to five. I, um, you know, the jobs that I saw the adults around me have. I mean, I grew up in Melbourne, Florida, right? So uh, anyways, and I didn't know how good I was. I, I didn't know, like, you know, it's one thing to be decent in your, you know, high school senior year, but it's entirely different to go to art school with real artists and like to be able to, you know, make it your own, right? And so um, I said, well, I don't know how good I'm going to be, but I'll, I'll find out, right? I, I just figured that, you know, I'd rather just lean into what I was good at than try to be what I was not. Right, and so that was my first risk, going to art school and taking the risk of being broke. Um, when I was 17, I came to New York City. I always knew I was gonna come to New York City, New York or die. Uh, <laughs> and um, when I got to art school, I went to Pratt, uh, which is a wonderful school, and I realized very quickly, um, I wasn't that good. <laughs> I really wasn't, I wasn't that good. I was surrounded by kids that went to like art high schools, right, and who like their parents had identified that when they were seven, that Robert had talent, and they'd you know given him tutors and oil paints, and he was like a master by the time he got to Pratt, right? And so I was like, okay, that's okay. I'll, I'll work harder. You know, I'm smart. I, I I felt good. I felt good about my intellect, and I was like, I'll, I'll work smart. I'll, I'll work harder, right? And so um, this leads us to my next uh, risk. I, I joined a group that was called Drawing Group. So at Pratt, you know, foundation year is all about figure study, and we drew the figure for eight hours a day right, charcoal, ink, you'd come home covered, right? But then a select few of us did drawing group, and drawing group was extended figure study from 8 o'clock to 10 p.m. One of us would pose in the nude, and the rest would draw. Yeah, and so uh, when I was being recruited for this, <laughs> I was informed that you got to see everybody else naked before you got up naked. So, you know, it's okay. You don't have to do it until you feel comfortable. You know, I was nervous because, you know, what is this going to do to my reputation? Like, is this going to get me in, you know, am I going to get a reputation or something? Or, you know, and, and also, like, how are people going to see me differently? But I really wanted to be good. I, there was no place in my head for something mediocre. And I wanted to be the best I could possibly be. And if this gave me extended time, to practice and to get good, I was gonna do it. And so the day of, it was my turn. I was nervous. I get on the stage. I was a Greek statue from the Metropolitan Museum, okay? I had poise, I had grace, and I was 18 and had nothing to be ashamed of, okay? So it all went well. And I did drawing group the whole time I was at Pratt and I loved it. And drawing group did two things for me that were so important. One, it, it made me really good. At, like I, I became really respected as a committed artist at Pratt. Um, in fact, by the time I, I left my senior year, I was you know, one of the only seniors recommended to Disney um, who was heavily recruiting at my school. In addition to that, um, it also taught me to not be afraid to bear my soul, to not be afraid to say, this is me, this is all of me, and I think that's such a fundamental trait that every single artist has to have, right? You have to be comfortable with who you are and what you're bringing to the table and you present your best self. And so uh, speaking to Dis of Disney, that leads me to my next risk. <laughs> you see, um, I was being heavily recruited to di by Disney and they were like a big deal for me because I grew up in Florida. And so I went there a lot. And then in addition to that, um, my mentor at Pratt used to take us to Disney to draw and to draw the crowds and the Ferris wheel and to study how Disney used culture and storytelling and the craftsmanship. And so it was kind of a big deal for me. And so when they flew me out and offered me a job, it caught me like off by surprise that I, I didn't want to take it. I, I actually turned it down. And everybody thought I was foolish. My mom, my teachers, my friends, everyone was like, what are you doing? You are so arrogant, right? And at the time, I was like, yeah, but I don't want to iterate on their IP. I want to create my own IP for my own culture. Because even then, I was like, you know, I, I'm, I'm Latina. I'm Venezuelan, Ecuadorian, married to a Colombian, right? <laughs> and so, and I wanted to see my stories, like where were my franchise brands? Like where were they, right? And I, I, 
I kind of knew that I would create something, even though back then I had no clue what I was going to create. Right? But I knew that I wanted to make something, and I also knew that I wanted to own it, because IT ownership is always kind of like, it's been important to me. I believe that artists should own what they create, and I believe that artists should benefit economically from what they create as well, right? And so um, instead, I went back to New York, broke, and I started hanging out with um, my sister's friends, <laughs> who were all ad execs, not ad execs, but execs from the Latin space, right? So it was like Puerto Rican, Cuban. I discovered this whole thing called the Hispanic market, right? Which I never knew existed. I don't know if you guys know that like the Latin economy is like the fifth largest economy in the world. And like there's more Latinos here than Canadians in Canada. Like it's like this whole thing that like I had no idea. Did you know that the United States is the number two Spanish speaking country in the world, right? So anyways, there's this whole industry dedicated to explaining the Hispanic market to corporate and then getting budgets and telling wonderful creative stories and building brand, right? And so I started an advertising agency with a bunch of these guys and I had no experience in advertising and I was broke, but it felt right. <laughs> it felt right. And you know, some shocker, advertising is not brain surgery. You can figure it out, right? So. Um, I became a sponge and I learned from everyone around me. I learned from my co-founders. I learned from the people that I hired. I learned from my clients. I learned from everybody. And it was so much fun. I, I, I loved building. I loved, you know, casting for a given brand and for a given project. I loved creating brand stories that would actually move hearts and minds, right? I loved having impact. I loved that I could make a, 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 a statement, a piece of art, and if you put it in a gallery, maybe 50 people will see it. But if you put it on a billboard or you put it on TV, millions will see it, right? And so that idea of the impact stories and messaging can have, which at the time I was using it to sell things, but also that idea that people will see themselves represented and feel proud. And that idea that you as a creative are valuable because you're solving a business problem, right? And that, that was something that I really took to heart because creativity can also often be just so subjective, right? But if you're solving a business problem, if you're delivering an audience that people need, if you're solving a challenge that you have, all of a sudden you become more valuable as a creative, right? And so I did that for 12 years. Um, we ran a, a small boutique Latin agency and we worked with a lot of the um, next hand, hand in hand with a lot of the great general market agencies. And I did it for 12 years and then I kind of hit a wall. And the wall was the following. Two things were happening, two big trends. On the one hand, we were moving into a content space where every brand had to be a content brand, right? And so more and more, it was about story and also social media all of a sudden became a thing. And so you could own your own audience. And at the same time, I was really frustrated because they kept on putting me in this little Latin bucket. And yeah, I speak fluent English. So just, yeah. you know, I grew up in Melbourne, Florida, right? So even though I did also live in Caracas for four years and I speak fluent Spanish as well, um, I really felt that I had a global purview and I wanted to bring, I mean, at the time, like salsa's out well, selling ketchup, it still is, by the way. Um, you know, Despacito was a thing, now it's Bad Bunny. So our, our culture was clearly having an impact, right? And at the same time, it was like, yeah, but your idea is cute, but we're going to do this general market thing. Could you translate it? <laughs> and so I was like, all right, all right. Um, the real opportunity for me is content. Um, my people don't need people to sell them anything more. They're already over indexing. I mean, we, you, we're 19% of the population, yet we buy 30% of the stuff. <laughs> it's like, there was this thing on the PR the other day that, you know, it's again, 19% of the population, but we make up the 42% of the, of, the, of the streaming shows, right? In terms of what we consume, not what we are due in front of the camera or behind the camera, they were incredibly underrepresented, right? And so I, I kind of, like a voice inside of me had said, you know, you need to go into content. You draw, so you should go into kids' content because they're the ones that like the pictures, right? And you need, now you know what's needed. You know how you can serve because, again, I, I believe in listening to, like, what you love to do, what you do really well, how you can serve and how you can make money, right? And so I sold the agency and then I took another big risk, which is I completely walked away from advertising and I took time off for two years. So I, I married this wonderful gentleman over here <laughs> and I, I made a deal with him. I made a deal with him. I said, 
Sweetie, give me two years. Give me two years to incubate, to listen to myself, to incubate my ideas, right? To draw, to paint, to think. And in two years, if nothing happens, I'll get a job, right? Um, and so at the end of two years, by then I was having kids too, right? And I was like, okay, where's, where are my board books? Where's my apps? Where's my, you know, single on beautiful videos? Where's my brands? Like, where are they? And uh, they didn't exist. Just fun experiment, all right? Think of a successful, like a Latino preschool show, just in your minds. Like, can, how many of you can think of a successful Latino preschool show? Okay, if you're all thinking Dora, <laughs> just, just really quick, Dora's 23 years old, okay? Dora's 23 years old and was not created by a Latino, just say it, you know? And, um, but Dora is a $15.8 billion brand, right? So clearly, Dora resonated with a lot of people, right? So since Dora created 23 years ago, there has not been much, right? And so I was like, you know, not only are we 19% of the population, we are 26% of kids, 26% of kids, and yet we only appear in 5% of media, which is a business opportunity. <laughs> 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 okay. and, so, and so I was like, okay, I can do this. I can do this. I know how to build brands. I know how to run teams. I know the stories. I love the stories. I love culture. I'm going to start with the simplest thing, which is the low-hanging fruit, which is honestly a public service. I'm going to take all the wonderful Latino nursery rhymes that I know are popular, whether you're Cuban, you're Mexican, you're Venezuelan, you're Ecuadorian, and I'm going to make a beautiful Latino nursery rhyme brand. And it's going to be called Canticos. And it's going to be musical, and it's going to celebrate the different types of musical genres. And it's going to bring all of these wonderful nursery rhyme characters. And I'm going to start with books. And I'll be non-commercial about the books, right? Because I know how moms like to be non-commercial. Um, and I wanted to do books, sing-along video, and app at the same time because I felt like kids expect the app. They, they expect, like, where can I touch? Where can I see? Like, they expect it all, right? And I got lucky. So when I started having lunch with people and, and saying what I was doing, it was like going back into, like, civilization. So I did, I did no FOMO for two years, and I was like, okay, now I'll start talking to people. Um, I found like the one person who was like just as crazy as I was and just as eager to do something in this space. And he, you know, used to be the global media buyer for Walmart and the global media buyer for Starcom MediaVest. So he knew the business opportunity and the corporate appetite for the Latin customer. And he was having kids and he was Dominican. His wife was from El Salvador and he was feeling the same thing I was feeling, which was like, where's our stuff, <laughs> right? Um, and so we joined forces and created, we created a company called Encantos, okay? So Encantos was created in 2015, and Encantos is a lovely word because it kind of embodied all the charm and magic that we wanted to bring to kids. And we roped our spouses into it, right? <laughs> My husband on the tech side, his, his wife on the social media side. And so these two Latino families came together to create original IP centered in Latin culture that would have global appeal. Again, the vision was our culture has global appeal. It's made for everyone. Just like everyone can eat tacos, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone can dance Bad Bunny. Everyone will love these stories. That was the vision, right? And so we, we built Canticos and Canticos came out with a bang. You know, we executed well, I have to say. You know, we hired the studios. Steven knew how to raise money. I don't know how to raise money. <laughs> we raised money. Uh, and we built a beautiful brand that had, you know, it, you know, we worked with Nickelodeon. It was on TV. It was on YouTube. It has music publishing. Um, and you know what? Um, the next thing I knew, we were Emmy nominated, which was, you know, really exciting. Ooh. All of a sudden, there was an Emmy nominee pressure. You guys said I wrote every song. I storyboarded all the very, all the first, you know, um, the first iterations. Like, I, it was like everything. I was doing everything all at the same time. I was illustrating, I was writing, and I, I, again, loving every second. And so, now it's like, okay, Canticos is out there. If you're Latin, you know who we are because we're really, like, I get the love letters, right? I get the moms telling me, thanks to you, my child is bilingual, right? Um, and now it's, 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 again, taking those risks. Um, how do we continue to convince gatekeepers that Latin culture and Latin, Latin IP 
has global appeal, right? How do we convince gatekeepers and streamers that it's okay if you have more than one Latin property on your channel or on your platform, <laughs> right? How do we convince gatekeepers that, you know, authenticity behind the camera is just as important as the story that you're trying to tell and to have Latino storytellers telling Latino stories, owning the IP that they create is really important, right? And how do we continue to build that direct relationship with our fan base and leverage the technology platforms that are out there to get scale and to get audience so that we can grow and we can scale. And so, I don't know, like we're still figuring all of this out, right? Every single day is, is a new challenge, it's a new thing. But it's, it's so something I'm willing to risk to figure out. Like, I know that I won't be old and bitter thinking, <laughs> damn, I wish I had done this. Because I could fail, in which case I went out in a blaze of glory and all good. But I, I really do think that every single day there's, there's always a new thing to figure out and there's always a new sort of risk to be taken and they're all worth it. Oh, so many risks. So many risks. I'm obsessed with the, um, the risk of rest of like two years of space. Like, thank you, Carlos, for, for supporting that. It's like, yes, the risks we take and those that love us who support us while we take our risks. I mean, wow. But, but, but really, I think like there is so much risk in rest um, and it, that's sort of not talked about enough. So, so like may we risk to fail, but also maybe, maybe risk to rest. Um, okay, we have one more story, but we have one little slip before that. Love this. Several times throughout my career, I've given unsolicited creative notes on scripts during table reads. I'd say half of them were accepted. Some pretty good odds. Yeah. That's amazing. So we've got one more storyteller, and then we will have some question and answer time if there's been something that you want to hear a little bit more about. And then also the auction is still going even until tomorrow, actually. If you haven't gotten a chance to check out the coachings and tickets and prize offerings back there, um, we are raising money for CMA so it can continue to offer amazing programming to everybody in this room and beyond. And so that we can all continue to create stuff, um, get inspired to create stuff for kids that allows them to have the conditions to take risks. Like this is about us right now, but it's also about the work we do to create a generation that can do exactly what we're talking about doing. Uh, so we've got one more story to hear. Uh, she is a musician, um, Grammy nominated. She has worked with the likes of Beyonce and beyond. Please welcome Divinity Rocks. Yeah. Now I have to go, right? <laughs> So when I told my high school counselor that I'd only applied to two colleges in California, she looked at me like I was crazy. I was a senior in high school in Atlanta, and after hearing about the University of California at Berkeley from a good friend of mine's older brother, I decided that was the school I was going to. He said it was wild. He said it was a naked dude walking around, and women could hold hands. Now, I knew in high school that I was gay and that I couldn't be gay in Atlanta. However, I figured I could go all the way to California and be as free as I could be. And that's exactly what I did. Now I got out to California, but I was leaving something, I was leaving another part of me behind. I had a rap group that I had started in high school called Dat Boo, D-A-T-B-U. <laughs> Divinity and the Breakfast Unit. <laughs> the Breakfast Unit, yeah, they were a group of dancers with names like Cheesy Feets, Cornbread Lover, Cheese Lover. <laughs> so we formed this rap group and we had become really pretty popular in high school and things were going well for us, but I was not gonna be a rapper. My mom and dad had done so much for me to have an education and believe in education that ever since elementary school, I knew I was gonna to go to college. So I was trying to get as far away from home as possible. I applied to Berkeley and Stanford. I got a rejection letter from Stanford, but I got into Berkeley. Yeah. Woo! Yes. I get out there and I figured I was gonna be a journalist because that would support my love for writing. 
And I also enrolled into a Poetry for the People class. Poetry for the People was taught by the late, great June Jordan. How many of you know June? June is actually from New York City. She was the first person to say in front of the UN, we are the ones we've been waiting for. Oh. Yes, first person. So I got into her class and I became one of her student teacher poets. But doing this creative writing really reinvigorated my need to rap. So I found other rappers and artists around campus and we would have freestyle sessions with the other rappers who had decided to go to college instead of rapping, right? <laughs> I also met a whole group of musicians. I met this upright bass player on the bus one day. He and I happened to be going to the same house. Very strange. So I met him and we started hanging out. He introduced me to all the musicians at Berkeley and we started having parties. I was hosting freestyle parties. I was becoming pretty popular and really confident in my raps. And we decided to go into the studio. But while we were in the studio, nobody would listen to my musical ideas because they said I was just a rapper and I wasn't a musician. So I said to him, later on we're hanging out, I said, hey man, you know, I'm thinking about playing the guitar. He goes, nah, <laughs> you're a bass player. You walk like a bass player, you talk like a bass player. <laughs> you should get a bass. So I was like, okay. The next summer I went home, I bought a bass guitar and an amp, I brought it back to school and I fell in love. I started listening to the music in Atlanta that was blowing up at the time. Outcast was becoming pretty popular, Goody Mob, and they had some great bass lines. So I would just sit at home every day after school and play the bass. After my second year in college, things started getting a little crazy. I didn't have a lot of money. I had taken out a lot of student loans and I was missing this Atlanta music scene. It was blowing up and I was on the other side of the country. So I called my parents and I say, hey, I'm thinking about taking a year off of school. My dad was livid. He was not happy at all. But my mom, she was like, yeah, yeah, follow your dreams. <laughs> she used to say, shoot for the stars, you may land on the moon. So I took my mom's side of things and I moved into the, but I moved into the house with my dad because they had split up. So I moved in the house with my dad with this bass guitar and I'd be sitting there playing all these songs and he'd be looking at me growling and frowning, <laughs> you know, because what I was playing didn't sound like the songs I was trying to play, right? <laughs> Eventually, I taught myself how to rap and play and I started playing around town. I became really popular as this bass player in Atlanta. And I heard about this camp from an artist by the name of Mr. Victor Wooten. Mm -hmm. Victor Wooten was one of the greatest bass players in the world. I had to go to the camp. I applied to the camp, I got in. First night of camp, we have to introduce ourselves by playing the bass. So I asked Victor, well, can I rap and play the bass? He said, is that what you do? I said, yeah, that's what I do. I said, well, do what you do. <laughs> so I stand up in front of this audience, heart racing, beating, I'm scared out of my mind. And I start playing this bass line. Boom, 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 boom. I go, it was the D-I, the V-I, the N-I, the T-Y. You want to be I, baby, you can't see I. The boom, 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 boom. Uh, uh. Now everybody say, ow, ow. The crowd goes, ow. And everybody cheers. And I'm thinking, wow, that was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Two months after the camp, Victor calls me on the phone and asks me if I had more songs like that. I said, yeah, man, I got a lot of songs like that. <laughs> <laughs> I had one song. That was it. <laughs> Say yes, right? <laughs> so he asked me if I wanted to tour with him. I was like, yeah, of course I want to go on tour with you. And so when I hung up the phone, I was like, man, I got to write some more songs. <laughs> so I sat down, I wrote some songs that I could play on this tour. And... I started making my own music on his tours. He let me do my thing. He let me play my songs on his tour. He let me jump out on stage and freestyle whenever I wanted to. I went home, I started writing albums, and I wrote my first children's music song. It was called, I Can Be Anything. Now when I was a little girl, my mom used to wake us up in the morning and scream at us that we could be anything in the world we wanted to be. This was how she loved us. She delivered it like an angry Baptist minister. <laughs> Seriously, you can be anything in the world you want to be if you put your mind to it. She had a sermon every morning. So I had hooked up with this record label here in New York City called Raucous and they wanted to create a children's label. 
And they had been soliciting artists and they thought that I would be a good fit. So I wrote this song called, I can be anything, you can be anything. <laughs> Girls and boys can do anything, 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 anything. <laughs> so much fun. I had my little five-year-old nephew and niece get on the song and we rapped to each other back and forth. It was so cool. And I started thinking, wow, kids music. I never thought about it before. This could be kind of cool. It was fun. Well, the label folded. Somebody stole my song. Oh. We won't get into that. <laughs> and I forgot about the kids' music thing. As a matter of fact, what I said was, you know what? When I get older, I'm going to write kids' music. That's going to be what I do. I'm going to write kids' music. I'm going to write kids' books when I get older. So fast forward, I'm putting out my music. I'm doing my thing. I'm in the streets. I'm playing the bass and rapping, making rock music and pop music. And then one day, I hear that Beyonce is looking for musicians for an all-female band. Now, I was not interested in the Beyonce gig at all. My friends, they convinced me that I should go to this audition despite my resistance. And I got the gig. <laughs> I get the gig and I travel all around the world with Beyonce as her bass player and musical director for five years. I played on her Grammy <laughs> Grammy nominated, Me, Myself, and I album. Yes. It, was, it was incredible. But there was a part of me that was still missing my artistry once she took a break. So I moved to LA and I kept writing my rock and hip hop music, doing my thing. I was touring with different artists and putting out records. And during the pandemic, something strange happened. All the gigs on the calendar disappeared, mm. <laughs> wiped out. And I didn't know what I was going to do, so I decided I was just going to start working on my next project. A friend of mine called me and said, hey, do you have any kids music you've been working on? I said, well, you know, a little something here and there, little beats that I've been making throughout the years. He said, yeah, so this, this, this company is looking for music for this pre-K program. Do, if you have something you can share with me, I'd love to take it to them. So I was like, okay, well, what kind, of, what kind of stuff are you looking for? He gave me some themes, and I wrote about seven, five songs. He needed seven songs. I wrote five songs. Sent it to him. He said, man, I love these songs. I'm going to share them with Scholastic. He shared the songs with Scholastic. They loved the songs, and they wanted each one of those songs for this pre-K program. And then later on, I found out they wanted to turn two of the songs into fully illustrated books. Now, I'm like, what? <laughs> I guess my older self is now. <laughs> What's crazy is that I had these two books coming out and these songs that were a part of this scholastic program, and I started thinking, well, if I'm going to have two books coming out, I should probably make a whole album. <laughs> yeah, of course. So I started working on this kids' music album. It was called Ready, Set, Go. The song Ready, Set, Go was inspired by my mom's morning sermons. It's all about being prepared and being your best self and getting ready to have the best day ever, basically. I self-released this project because, like you, I'm always thinking that we should own our intellectual property. I am the descendant of people who were in bondage. People owned them. They owned everything that they did, but they thought their children everything. I always felt like it was time to own myself and my own ideas. I've been self-releasing the music for years, but I self-released this Ready, Set, Go album. And lo and behold, it was nominated for a Grammy. <laughs> my older self is here now. <laughs> it's crazy because I never really thought that making music for children would be what I would pivot into doing. Now I'm doing concerts where little kids are jumping up and down and screaming my name. I just did a concert recently, and after the show, I usually sign autographs and take pictures. This little girl wrapped her leg, wrapped her whole body <laughs> around my leg and would not let go. <laughs> Her dad is standing there 
and he's trying to convince her, we should go, honey, we should go. And she's like, no, no, I'm never leaving you. I love you. I want to take you home with me. I'm like, oh, oh my God. <laughs> it's crazy. I'm getting those emails. I'm getting those messages, those video messages from people about how this music is inspiring them, empowering them, that somebody like me is not just a reflection. I'm also a window into which people who don't look like me can see what the other side lives like, looks like, loves like. And it's okay because we're all human. We all smile. We all laugh. We all have the same emotions. We get scared. We believe. So I'm going to leave it at that. We yeah. believe. Yes. Thank you, Divinity. Oh, my gosh. Thank you, Divinity. Also, thank you, Divinity's mom. Like, yeah. your mom rules. And I also feel like the older me is now. Is that a song? Have you written that song? That's a song. Oh, my God. The older me. It's a book. It's a song. It's a whole. It's a movement. Um, I, just, I love it. So, okay. Th those are our stories. Thank you so much to our amazing storytellers. Uh, like so many threads of self-knowing and scooching in all the different directions um, and, and surprises and also like self-knowing and then other people kind of knowing for you like you know Victor Wooden he knew he knew and you knew eventually and now we're going to do a little Q&A so if you've got something that you want to ask any of these storytellers now would be the time to do that we'll bring some chairs up um, and then there'll be some more hanging drinking uh, scanning the room for those uh, auction items too so yeah we'll bring chairs up sweet hello uh, my name is Malia, uh, you're all so amazing and so hilarious. Um, my question is uh, what you found most rewarding in children's, in the children audience that uh, maybe you found was lacking when you're working in adult audiences? I can start from performing, specifically, kids have no filter. It's just so immediate. Honest. The, the second a beat drops, they will let you know with their bodies and their movements exactly how they feel. And if they're not feeling it, my daughter is my biggest critic. So she'll be like, uh-uh, this ain't it. This ain't it. <laughs> so it feels really good to get that immediate response and feedback to what you're doing. And it's like when you feel that, because come on, the older you get, sometimes we, not, we be too cool, you know, and the wall <laughs> might not give it. So it's very encouraging. It is. I love that so much. And it's so true. It's the most honest audience ever. Like it's either working or it's not. And there is no in between. It's like not objective or it's not subjective. It's objective. They're into it or they're not. Um, any, any, well, anyone, anyone else want to share on that? Yeah. Add to that, the love. They yeah. just mm. come and yeah. they hug you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're just unabashed about the affection that they give you. It's really, really sweet. Adults just don't do that. Yeah. Less, less love when you're making stuff for adults too. Yeah. Also, when you're making something, it's like these kids are, are learning to be real humans, you know, real, real citizens of the world uh, as they're watching something and, and learning. So it's so rewarding when you're trying to teach some sort of lesson, whether it's like a math or reading or if it is a more social emotional uh, lesson, that as soon as they apply it, you start to feel like what you made, like it's a building block to who they're going to become as adults. So you have a say in that. And it's amazing. That to me is the most rewarding part of Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, another question for our storytellers. Hi, I'm Diana. I'm wondering if you guys have like a personal motto or mantra that defines your career or like what's kept you going through all these risks and changes? Scary, it's worth it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. beautiful. Push through the fear. Yeah. Yeah. You, push, you really have to push through it because like you said, when you, when you get that feeling, you know that it's really worth it. What you're about to go do is really worth it. I'm sure each one of us had that feeling even coming up here, but it's so worth it to tell these stories and share these stories with other people. As, as a broke artist, you know, I, I had a saying, like, you know, when it, are you good enough? I was like, fear is a luxury I can't afford. It's very simple. <laughs> and then the other thing, um, I, I actually put this in, in, my, in my book, it's like, Maybe I can or maybe not, but I'm going to give it all that I got. Yeah. Oh, love that. Love that. Good. Yep. Anybody else want to share? Did uh, you? God got me. You know, just this confidence. Mm. So no matter what I step into, I can fail. It'll be fine. Mm. It'll all work out. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess I'm the only one. <laughs> <laughs> I 
actually stole this from my son because I have him do these nightly affirmations. And then I realized pretty far into them, like, why am I not doing this for myself? Mm. I'm like so into it for my son. Why am I not doing it for me? So I stole this from my son, but saying um, I have courage and I'm brave um, is my little push. I love that. When I start to freak out. Mm, I love that. Um, And I just want to say that that beautiful question came from Diana, who is my CMA mentee. And uh, you don't know about them. (laughs) That's my girl. Uh, The mentorship program is really wonderful from the mentee and mentor side. So if if you're new to CMA, just like make sure you check out the mentorship program. It's amazing. Um, Also, I I want to share the the one mantra that I work with a lot is um, nothing that is meant for me requires a tight grip, Um, which and I love for Sal, like for your like leaving like kids and then coming back to it. Like sometimes we come back to the places that we are meant to be, even when there's a risk to step away, um, then there becomes a risk to come back. But yeah, nothing that is meant for me requires a tight grip. I don't know, somebody, my friend told me that and I like it. Uh, one from my mom. Oh yeah, yeah oh, we got to hear from your mom. mom. Divinity's mom, everybody. Oh. Mom says always expect a miracle. Mm. Oh. Yeah. So I live by that yeah, for sure. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. Uh, okay, any other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, First of all, I just want to mention, look at this beautiful group of people up here. I'm so tired of seeing like five old white men up on stage. Um, So thank you to CMA and to you guys for for doing this. Um, My question is, um, I mean, this is so much about risk, but what about also a mistake that you made or something that went wrong and that you were like, oh, okay, this is... How do I turn it around and how do I learn from it or grow from it or correct it or beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Anybody got like a little nugget of a mistake? There's so many. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you look up, I'm like cry, like um. I can't think of a specific mistake. I just know that because there's so many, there really are. Uh, but it's also like just knowing from the people that are around you, like not being so egotistical and not, yeah. not be conscious of yourself, not admit that you're making those mistakes, being like quick to recognize them. Um, and, and then, fall, you know, even if I'm a, a leader in a situation, like the way I like I need is uh, to follow someone on my team. Right? Maybe he's going to help correct the mistake. So um, those are, there's, there's, there really are so many mistakes. I can't think of just one. I, I would say that most of my mistakes came from not paying close enough attention to people oh. and not communicating well enough. Usually that will be where, that's the road to hell. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes uh, desperation, clawing, trying to get a big break, I did things and took things that I knew were out of my character mm-hmm. and I kind of did them anyway and I'm like, eh, it still feels weird to like think out and everything's permanent, so don't do stuff you don't want to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Really thankful that YouTube was not a thing. You know? Yes. <laughs> very, very thankful. I think it, one of the mistakes I've made was hurting people I loved being, being selfish mm-hmm. in situations. And like you said, it comes from desperation and thinking that, only thinking about me in a situation instead of thinking about how my decision would affect the people around me. There are times I would go back and and I think I would you know want to do it want to do it over again because I I feel like I'm I left some really awesome people behind. Mm. There's such good information in mistakes like the information about what's important and what's not the information about like. Uh, oh, how, how do I listen better, or how do I love better, or how do I, you, you know, whatever it is, but there's good information in mistakes. Uh, thanks so much, everybody. Uh, I think most of you mentioned that you became parents at some point along your career journey, and I'm wondering how you balance the calculus of risk differently, if mm-hmm. at all, since you've become a parent. That's that a good was question. a big reason why I didn't want to go to L.A. to do Blippi's Treehouse, um, because... This is vulgar, but I always say, like, my son was, like, on my butthole for, like, <laughs> for, like the first three years. Like, I was, I, like, he's just on me all the time, and I'm not a physical, touchy person, so I was just like, oh, my God. But anyway, that's, like, another thing for therapy. But, um, 
I, it was a long time to go the other side of the country, but then it was just like a little rewiring of the brain because I want my son to see me doing what I love. I want him to see me work. So I had the opportunity for him to come to LA for a few days to watch me film and, and see why I was away uh, so much. That's important to me, for him to see, see me working and doing what I love. For me, my kids are at the heart of what I do. I mean, we, I made, I illustrated my first book and like, uh, like we made the first app during my maternity leave of my uh, second child. We um, put out our first Canpicos book in 2016, which was when Trump went to office. And so here I'm raising little Latino kids that need to be proud of who they are. They need to love their culture. And so everything I do, like really, it's, it's really thinking about how my kids are going to see the world and how other kids that, you know, are like my kids are going to, are going to see the world and see themselves, for sure. My daughter, she's such a free spirit. And I was raised so strict. So I feel like I'm honestly learning a lot from her. Like a lot mm -hmm. of what I do is hopefully providing some form of influence. But I think it kind of is flipping that brain a lot like yo you are free <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah for, for me it's um my wife is a little more risk averse now that she did come here and is uh has made this her home um so like i'm uh trying i still kind of try to keep conscious of, of taking risks and trying to be a model right for her because i want her to be able to kind of recognize things in her life as she grows up uh and take chances because uh, they've worked out so well in a lot of ways for me. So it's, still, it's that counterbalance. So it's nice because my wife will be like, no, no, no. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. We can take one more question. Yes. Hi, my name's Riley. Who's been your biggest mentor? Like either as a child or like in your career, or whenever. Mom. Tops. Yeah. Tanity's <laughs> mom. Mom is pretty awesome. We love her. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. She is our mentor now. <laughs> uh, for me, it was my um, my high school theater teacher because my world, even though I always dreamed to go to New York City, my world in Kentucky was so tiny, and she was constantly like pushing me outside of my boundaries, and like she was the one who. Um, told me like, oh, you really like this acting stuff. You know, there's other theaters in the area. You can perform outside of school and would like bring me the auditions and the brochures. And like to this day, she's one of the first people I text if I get like a cool gig and I'm 39. And, and I met her when I was 14. And so, yeah, she's like one of my biggest cheerleaders. Um, for me, besides my dad, I would say definitely the people um, that owned the nonprofits that I was a teaching artist with, like they were the first people that really created careers. Like I didn't really see that working with schools, educators, school district system, getting funding, figuring out these relationships, building. I'm like, oh, y'all smart, y'all on to something. Yeah. I uh, so my I mean my parents, uh, like I said, they're they were immigrants here, and, and just seeing like just the work ethic, right, and what they were doing to kind of put their kids in front and, and do whatever they needed to do to give us a bigger opportunity. So they were just huge mentors in that way. Mm -hmm. In high school, I had a, um, I had this chemistry teacher uh, who was sort of, you know, at that point he seemed so old. He was twenty five. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was like this young kind of teacher. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, um, and like the way that he taught in class, where he was like super strict off the bat, and would, and just like this short Filipino man who was like so energetic and so, uh, but like very strict with everything. And then once you got to know him, he would like bring you in. And become like this really uh, become like a lifelong friend and it mm. sort of taught me how to um, be able to, to work with people and try to mentor people like so yeah sometimes you can, you can be strict but also like there's this heart and things that you have to bring to people and that is always something that's been uh, like, in front of my mind. So I have two people mom who <laughs> who oh she she feared nothing like if there was we thought there was a burglar in the house. She would go and like just search the house and see what was going on. Uh, and then she would go swimming in our pool naked in the middle of the night. Uh, and, um, and she used to tell me, um, she used to tell me, Susie, you can do anything you put your mind to. And she just had that confidence. And the other person was my mentor in school, and, and um, his name was Dave Pasolacqua, and he's mentored a lot of like very, very successful artists. 
And he taught me to study culture and to use culture in, in what I did in terms of how I told story. And he's, when I started to get really good too, he used to tell me, Susie, talent, that and a nickel won't get you on the subway. <laughs> and I didn't know what that meant for like the longest time. And now I do. <laughs> and it's, it's really, really, really wide, but it's not about talent. It's not about being the smartest person in the room, right? It's about being empathetic. It's mm. about being curious. It's about the problems that you're solving. So that was just really great advice. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much. Thank you to our storytellers. Thank you to CMA, to Susie and Karen. And uh, don't forget to take another lap out there. Look at the auction items. Talk to each other. Make a new friend. Share a story of risk. Yes, exactly. Have a drink. Have a snack. And uh, we'll see you next year. Yay!